Hello again, all friends of the Enterprise Development Property Fund. Today, we are going to host our friend Maya Deval, an attorney here in Cape Town. Um, and we are going to be joined by the Ekasi Property Group. Um, they are going to join us via Zoom. So the discussion today will be um, quite open. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about the legal aspects of property, uh, or one of the components thereof anyway. Uh, that component being uh, what type of structure should you set up for your property, uh, for your property portfolio. Whether that be a trust, a uh, company, uh, whether you should buy it in your personal name, etc. So that's what we're going to discuss today. Um, and we will welcome uh, Maya Deval quite soon. Um, and then we will start talking about this particular topic. As I said, we will be joined by Ekasi Property Group. Um, so you will find during this session that we will have some questions coming up uh, from the Ekasi Group. And uh, we will try our best to uh, reply um, as best we can to those questions. Uh, but... Uh, you may or may not be able to hear their questions. If you don't, um, we will repeat the question and then the answer as well. So uh, very soon we will be joined here by Maya and uh, we're looking forward to today's session, uh, which is the final session of the Property Investment Fundamentals course, uh, session number six. And um, the session, like I said, will be specifically geared towards understanding the type of property uh, portfolio you should have, the setup you should have to start your property portfolio. So guys, um, enjoy the session with me. Um, I'm quite excited to have my year in our office. All right, um, guys, thank you very much again for your time. Um, the, I'm Nigel Adriansa from the Enterprise Development Property Fund, for those who don't know. Uh, we run an incubator here in Pinelands, and uh, we, are, we hope to share as much information as possible to allow you to become a property entrepreneur. Today we've got Maya Deval. Um, he is my favorite attorney here in Cape Town. Uh, I won't say South Africa because Nicole Norville is my favorite attorney in Joburg. So <laughs> but uh, here in Cape Town, definitely Maya is my favorite attorney. And uh, when, whenever we have anything that we need to do, especially in the incubator, uh, we always refer our guys uh, to Maya. So Maya, um, uh, over to you. Um, I'd like to, you to just um, tell everybody who you are, uh, your, a little bit of your history, and what it is you guys are doing now. I know you guys are involved in some very exciting things. We're talking about FLISP, we're talking about rent to buy, we talk about um, the uh, 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 My Bond Fitness and a whole host of other things. So Maya, uh, tell us all about yourself. So my journey started in 1980 when I was a third year student in Bloemfontein and I actually started working at the office of a master of a high court. And I worked there for six years, and then I learned quite a lot about the estate, deceased estate, insolvent estate, and also trust. Then I came to Cape Town um, a few years later. I've been in Cape Town now for 33 years. And immediately when I came to Cape Town, I saw there was a school for practical legal training. And I decided I want to keep my mind sharp and my on, on the top of everything. And I started lecturing at the school for legal practice. And that led me later on to be invited to start uh, lecturing on sexual titles. And so I've always, it's always a passion of mine to actually share my knowledge. A lot of people keep a very close book and they say, I don't want to share what I've learned. And I, I have an open book uh, concept. I say I want to share with everybody. A lot of people say, let's sign an NDA, not disclose. And I say, no, I actually want everybody to disclose what we've learned, what we know. And so that led me to making, uh, developing through the last uh, 13 years concepts like um, rent to buy. We developed then getting yourself fit, my bond fitness. Then we developed um, online tools. We also then developed and fine tuned the concept of government subsidies for first time buyers. And I met Nigel about three years ago when I saw his newsletter. And I said to Nigel, I would like to share my knowledge experience in the market being a property attorney for like 35 years i would like to share that and i also learned from this because it's so amazing interacting with the young students and experienced students 
I learn every day and for me as giving something of my experience and then I get a lot back through this because I get challenged, I get uh, answers getting um, directed to me and I love interacting with people and see how we can help to shape them their own property portfolio. I've owned many properties myself in the past, I looked at different structures, I had some failures, I had some successes, so you've got to go through the mill of actually going through the cycle of the property um, turnaround. We saw that properties at one stage many years ago, the interest rates went from 11,000 for commercial properties to 25,000 rand, uh, 25 percent, and that killed the property market. So we had to come up with innovative ideas, always protect yourself. And this is, I think, where our discussion today goes about looking at trust, looking at your assets on your own name, and looking at companies. So thanks a lot for the opportunity to be here today, Nigel. I really appreciate it. And thank you very much, Numiso, for hosting all this today. Thanks a lot. All right. So, um, Numiso, I think what I'm going to do, we'll jump straight into the questions. Um, and then we'll, we'll just run through. I've got about eight questions that I'm going to ask Maya today. And uh, hopefully those eight questions will give everybody enough information to structure their business. So today we're going to talk specifically about structuring your business, your property business. Um, and like I said, there are eight specific questions that I'm going to ask Maya. Um, and hopefully that will take us uh, and give us enough info. So question number one, Maya. From a legal perspective, what is the best legal structure to use when you start a new property portfolio? So is it a company? Is it uh, a private or public company? Um, is it a trust, a business or a family trust? Is it a sole proprietorship? Is it a partnership, a cooperative? There are so many other ways that you can structure your property portfolio and the business that's behind it. So give us an idea and, and give us your input in terms of what it is if I start a new company. What's the best way to structure that business? Thank you very much, Nigel. I always look at risk. Number one for me in planning the portfolio is risk management. Number one, do I want to put the assets on my own name? Because if I sell the property, what will happen to capital gains tax? What will happen one day when I die? What will happen if I get divorced? What will happen if I get sued? When you look at the considerations of taxes, uh, the implication of taxes on my own name, because you'll find that some of the property taxes are less onerous. For example, capital gains tax, you have an exemption on your private residence if you sell it. Now you start looking at the second portfolio is, do I put my assets in a company? And again, the company, the whole idea of a company is to ring fence the risk associated with that. If you run a business and you put it in a company and something goes wrong with a the company, they can only sue the company. But if you have signed surety in your personal name, then again, they can run after you in your surety ship that you signed. However, now you look at who holds the shares in your company. If you hold it in your own name, you are almost like back into the same situation that the assets are held in your personal name. So if you die, if you go insolvent, if somebody sues you, they can grab your assets. Now, if the assets are on your own name or in a company, those shares are still held in your own name. So for me, ring fencing is very, very important. But you've got to look at where does the asset base lie eventually. Because if this company starts with 10 rand and it grows to 10 million rand, that 10 million rand will one day vest in your own personal name. And you actually have defeated the purpose of pegging estate growth. So what a lot of people do is to set up a trust then. And now you can look at a family trust or a business trust. You also have a trust that you can create in a will. That's called the trust mortis causa. That only kicks in the day that you die. But let's revert to a will, a trust that you can create while you're alive. And that is called the inter vivos trust. Inter vivos between, means between living people. So you create a trust between a trustee and the donor. And the donor actually asks the trustees to look after the assets of a trust on behalf of the beneficiaries. So coming back now to where we started is my suggestion would be to look at a company. And in the company, the shares will be held by a trust. Now you can decide if you want to use a family trust or a business trust. And a business trust, we actually don't use quite a lot because we rather than convert to a company, but in a business trust, it will be me and my, Nigel, for example, having a trust with um, 
predetermined beneficiaries. So I'll have 50% and Nigel will have 50%. Most likely that 50% of mine will again held, be held by a trust. So it will be Nigel's trust owning 50% and, or, and my trust owning 50% or you can have 60-40. So a business trust is a, is a trust where you have your shares regulated and fixed. In a discretionary trust, like a family trust, the trustees have a discretion who to give the benefit of the trust to. And this amazing opportunity actually helps you to do what we call the conduit principle. You can actually distribute the income to the beneficiaries according to the discretion of the trustees. So for example, if you receive a million rand income this year, you can give that to the five beneficiaries in any proportion you want. If you have a business trust, you must go 50-50 or according to the shareholding, if you can call it that in a business trust. The same with a company. If you have five shareholders, that five shareholders must receive the money in the right proportion to their shareholding. So trust does have a lot of benefits where you can actually move around the income and also the capital or not move around but distribute that and you can distribute that to the person that will pay the least amount of tax in a fixed uh, trust for a business trust you don't have a discretion the same applies in a company so usually one would look at setting up a company and underneath a the company there would be a trust holding the shares that's the Kind of, I think it's like a standard way. There's nothing standard in setting a property portfolio. A lot of people actually just go out straight and buy the property in a trust. Quite often people come to me and say, I actually have bought this property in a company and this company is the same as my business, running a panel beater, running an advertising company, running a consultation business. And I say to them, why? They said, because of tax. I say, what tax? They say, I can deduct the money that I pay every month from the property for my business expenses and I say to them that's the worst thing you can do because what you've done now you've broken this ring fence concept you've actually added all your properties into the risk of your business what happens to tomorrow if you sell your business what happens if your business has a bad run for for income and somebody wants to sue or liquidate that business you lose your property so what we always advocate is to actually then again set up separate entities where your property owning company will be in a separate company or a trust and you'll sign a lease agreement between the landlord and your operation company so that way you actually separate and ring fence your risk again so it's very important and the amazing thing about that you can actually easily register this property owning company or entity or trust for VAT because if you have a commercial lease agreement SARS there are two ways to register for VAT. One is on a voluntary basis where your revenue exceeds a million rand and, and one is where you're a, a landlord that charges VAT and I think the threshold is about over 30,000 or 20,000 rand. We need to check on that. But it's very easy to register as a landlord for a commercial property for VAT and then you can most likely even buy the property as a going concern and you can pay zero VAT um, on the property purchase. So there are so many um, ways to structure a property portfolio that one can't say follow A or follow B or C. Well, I always like to sit with my clients and I ask them, let's work out why. Even now dealing with the EDPF opportunity for properties that Nigel has made available, I said to some of the students that came to me, is this your first property? And they say yes. And they say to me that they want to buy the property in a company or a trust. And I say, well, also now comes the other question. How do you finance the property purchase? Because um, the banks actually need to involve a lot more admin when they apply, when somebody applies on a trust. And therefore, they feel there's more risk involved. And quite often you'll find that the trust will have to pay a 5 or a 10 or 15 or 20 percent deposit. Whereas if you buy your first property, you may even get a 100% home loan as a first-time buyer. You can also then qualify maybe for a government subsidy called FLISP. So maybe buying your first property, consider to put it in your own name. I had a consultation with a lady on Thursday, and she can qualify for an 88000 subsidy from the government. So the question is, why do you throw that away mm. if you can actually get free money from the government, reduce your home loan, from 350,000 Rand with 88,000 Rand, apply for a lower home loan and actually qualify easier for that home loan, negotiate a better interest rate. 
Mm. So again, what I'm saying here is that I like to sit with everybody, work out exactly what is the purpose, what will they do with this property, how will it affect their risk in their portfolio, and maybe the first one is on a trust or a company or your own name. So there's actually really no um, standard answer that can apply. Mm. But those are the three, I would say, company or a trust or your own name. You can also buy in partnerships, but for me a partnership is a very risky business i would rather go into a company and in the company you would set up a shareholders agreement because a partnership is actually goes very wide you're also responsible for the debt of your partner Mm. yeah and this goes beyond the debt of a bond that debt can actually go behind the debt of a property and maybe other debt as well so partnership for me is actually a very risky business don't ever go into a partnership Rather set a company, and in the company you have a shareholders agreement. Then you have cooperatives, then you have a company that's listed, but obviously there you just buy shares in the company. So there are so many avenues to buy property, and you can even buy on a share block concept in a company. So there are so many structures that you can buy. Um, so it's important to know exactly how do you structure to simplify the process as well, and not make it too complicated, but also look at your future. You want to start adding assets to your portfolio and you do not want to grow too big Mm -hmm. and forget about that maybe in future this asset will triple in value and then you sit with a big estate duty problem you sit with if you ever sell the property why you do that with a legacy and all that stuff so there's no real one answer but it's good to know that there are many opportunities Mm -hmm. and explore them Mm. Okay, fantastic. So, um, just like I said uh, in one of the other sessions, uh, Ndumiso, um, is always make sure that you look at what, what's your end goal. If you understand and you know what your end goal is, then you know or you can then consult with professionals like Maya to say, how do I now structure this thing in order to make sure that in the beginning I don't cut my nose to spite my face uh, by structuring something too large that actually is not uh, the best option for when I begin. I may want to begin with just a single unit in my own name because I can maybe qualify for FLISP. I mean, in that way, you can not only reduce your bond, you don't have to pay a deposit because the FLISP is actually enough to cover your deposit. You may even not have to pay the legal costs because the bank may give you enough uh, money inside of the bond and if you structure the um, the sale agreement correctly you could even get away with not paying any legal fees so so it may very well be beneficial in the beginning to start in your own name but later on look at then structuring the business but that all depends on your personal um, situation like Maya says do not look at the thing as a generic thing and say I must register a company or I must register a trust. Consult with professionals, make sure that your plan for the future and what you're currently doing right now that it all matches one another and if it doesn't then rather go one way in the beginning and go another way later on when you grow your portfolio Um, or depending on your situation go straight to a company um, or go straight to a trust. So, so yeah, so those are the kinds of things that you need to look at. Do I, I would never recommend for anybody to do this on their own. I would recommend consult a professional, look at the structuring, look at your future, look at what it is your planning is, and then make a decision in terms of where you want to go with that. So the next question that I wanted to ask Maya is, um, would you prefer um, to... As a, as a beginner, let's say now you don't qualify for any of the plus for any of that sort of thing, and you want to go straight into the formal structure, right? Is it better to go into a company structure or into a trust structure? I've bought in the past, over the last 30 years, all of my properties in trust, because the trust was a very friendly structure to set up, and the moment that you raised a company, immediately SARS sends you a letter and say, hello, I see that you raised it, please <laughs> yeah. come and talk to me. But again, we always advocate that you must pay your taxes. And I see one question came up now, explain to me the different taxes on property and all that. We'll touch on that later. So if you start planning the, the company, you've always got to look at how do you take the money out 
So you've asked me a risk question, but I want to one of the risks are how much tax do you pay? Yeah. So if you have money that comes into the trust, you can distribute that profit in the trust to the beneficiaries free of tax in the trust. So if the trust empties the, the, the income statement or the bank statement for the year, the trust doesn't pay any tax because mm -hmm. it pays in the hands of the beneficiaries who receive that. If you leave it in a company, then the company pays 28% tax and then the company needs to distribute that money further to the beneficiaries and then there's the normal tax on, this, on dividend tax. So that's where the trust is more beneficial. But if you want to grow your portfolio, then you keep the assets or the income back into the trust and then the trust pays a 45% income tax and it's a straight tax. There's no sliding scale. If you leave it in the company and you want to grow the company, the company only pays 28% income tax. So it depends on what you want to do. Most of us want to grow a portfolio. So the current, one can say, like the, 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 the flavor of a month or the flavor of a year is to actually set up a company. And then the company is, again, you have to now decide where the shares will be. Will it be your personal name? I say no. You, then you put the shares in a trust. That, protect, that protects you the best anything that happens in your personal name. Nobody can touch your trust. Nobody can touch your company. But importantly, you have to manage your trust now carefully. Mm. You have to have at least three trustees. One of the trustees must be a professional person. You must manage this trust also well. You must have regular trust meetings. Because if anybody, the SARS, the ex-spouse or his business partner, can say that this trust was run as the individual alter ego of Nigel or Mayer or the trustee, they can say this trust was a fake. And they can actually uh, try to collapse the trust and let the assets of the trust fall back into your personal name. Mm. So again, you set up a trust, you set up a company, but you run this thing as your alter ego. And that's dangerous because now your entire structure can collapse. But in the, to answer your question quickly, is that a trust and a company can be the, the same protection and on the condition that it's structured properly. But the company can only be the best protection if those shares are not held in your personal name but held by a trust. Otherwise, mm. you actually nullify a lot of the protection that you want to try to achieve in the company trust structure by keeping the shares in your own name. Okay. All right. Great stuff. Okay, so once again, I mean, <laughs> yeah, the, this thing is so complicated that, I mean, I've been in this game for 20 years. And even I will not go and structure something on my own. I'll buy companies because it's quite easy to do that on SIPs. But in terms of deciding which structure is best for which portfolio, I personally would never do that on my own. I would always involve an entire team, in fact. It's not just the attorneys like Mayer, it's also my accountant, my tax consultant, um, and maybe one or two other people, uh, professionals that have been in the game for a while, that I will uh, consult with. So things like, for example, um, having three trustees. Until I spoke to Mayer, I didn't know that. So even me, like I said, 20 years in the game, I didn't know that having an, uh, 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 only one trustee could then result in a situation where it seems and the receiver looks at you as if you've actually bought the thing in your own name even though you have a trust because that trust is your as my has put it your alter ego and in the in the eyes of the receiver that means it's one in the same person so therefore um, it is better then to structure it in such a way that you make sure that the receiver never looks at it and says no but that thing is the same as you because there are three trustees of which Maya, I don't think you explained how many needs to be independent, how many needs to be uh, part of your family, all of that sort of thing. Okay, many, many years ago when we started with trust, it would be you, me and my wife and the beneficiaries would be me and my wife and my children. And then there was a land um, mark case, um, Parker versus the Department of, I think it, um, agriculture or something like that and that's where this thing came out that they said that if you are running the trust uh, as a family control then it's your alter ego so you have to bring at least one outside trustee into your trust 
So it doesn't mean to say that you have to have one or two or three. It just means that, again, it can't also be a rubber stamp with, with other trustee. Yeah. Some people say, oh, I'll bring my brother-in-law in. And what he does, he just rubber stamps. Because remember, if anybody starts to ask for questions, maybe one day in a court, and they say, no, my brother-in-law just always brought me this. I've never seen financial statements. I never participated really in meetings. I was just like... I just said yes whenever you want to do something. So it's critical that your independent trustee can add value and can also can say one day when he's in the four court, um, walls of a court and say, I actually helped decide what was happening in the trust. I played an active role. I sometimes vetoed matters. So mm. therefore, it's so critical. And nowadays, it's so easy with Zoom, actually, to have record a meeting. Make yeah. it five, ten minutes. Yeah. Record that meeting, save it, and there you have record of decision making in the trust. Sometimes we have business businessmen that run a trust that actually not done run a trust, but their business are in the trust, and then we give them a power of attorney or a mandate inside the trust to say you can trade up to ten or fifty or five million rand inside the trust because the trust is active. And then we need to anything that exceeds that per annum, mm. you've got to come back to the trustees. Um, we try not to do too much business like a day-to-day -day business in a trust. Yeah. You rather than have a company, and in the company, the directors and the shareholders shareholders will give direction to the director, the managing director, to buy and sell properties or whatever in that mm. case. But it, but the one important thing about having three or more trustees, you can have two as well. But the one benefit of a trust with three or more trustees is that a trust with three or more trustees are exempt from the National Credit Act. So the way that I explain to myself is that if you want to buy any, you apply for credit, the National Credit Act relates that the credit provider must do a means test on your income and expenses. And if you find that you can't pay this debt, they then have to say to you, sorry, I can't give you a loan because yeah. it's reckless lending. Yeah. So there are, two, um, there are two exemptions from this. One is a company with an asset base, base of more than a million rand or a turnover more than a million. And the other one is a trust with three or more trustees. Now, we always always thought, aha, this is the way to go and buy multiple properties. Of course, the trust can apply to buy a property. And then they can't NCA check this yeah. tr trust. Yeah. As long as the trust can pay, they, don't, they can't check the trust for NCA because the trust is exempt. Mm. But the banks have a sneaky way to get past that. So they actually check the sureties behind that. And yeah. that's me and you as the trustees. So, but when you, it does help you a great extent if you apply for a home loan that they don't have to uh, check the trust because the trust normally has got a zero asset base at that stage. It just started out fresh. Yeah. It doesn't have income. So then they actually go past the, behind the trust and they ask the trustees to stand surety. Yeah. So um, that is one of the exemptions and that's also one of the benefits when you buy a property on an installment sale agreement. Whenever you buy a property on an installment sale agreement, it's uh, regulated by the Alienation of Land Act. And then um, it says that if you enter into that transaction, the, credit pr the seller is deemed as a credit provider when you do installment sale agreement. And now the seller has to register under the NCA um, as a credit provider, and that takes a year or more. Yeah. And they have to say, apply the same rules, can you pay back this uh, installment? But if a buyer registers a trust and the trust then buys the property and it's got three or more trustees, you're able to get exemption there automatically from the National mm -hmm. Credit Act. So I use this quite a lot, similar to a rent to buy transaction where yeah. we do installment sales. And uh, then we actually, we've done like big transactions, small transactions, any property can be bought on an installment sale, but then your buyer must set up a trust to facilitate that. Mm -hmm. So does that not um, also then work in the case of a company? If, if the seller, let's say you do an installment sale agreement with the seller and you set up a company, if you buy that property, you now have a million rands worth of assets because the property is a million rand or more. Um, does that then also apply and you don't have to uh, register with the NCA and so on? It's almost like a chicken and egg because because <laughs> you have <laughs> at the start you haven't bought the pro you haven't okay. taken transfer yet yeah so you have a right to take transfer three years later yeah but because you haven't got the property on your on your your um, asset base yet 
Yeah. You can't use a property. So then you're not exempt. You're not exempt. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So all right. So you you have to already have an asset base of a million or more. Existing. Or your yeah. Turnover must be a million or more in order that's right. to qualify. Okay. Okay. I get it. Okay. That's fantastic. Okay. So the next thing that we want to talk about is how many trusts, what type of trust they are, um, and and what's the difference between all the different kinds of trusts. I've touched early on that, but um, the basic trust is what a lot of people call a family trust. Now, a family trust is basically where I would set up a trust and the inside I would be the donor in the trust. So you can get anybody to be the donor, but I prefer to have the husband or the wife in a family situation to be the donor. Mm-hmm. Then the trustees would be the, the husband, the wife, and the indiv- individual third party, and the beneficiaries would be a group of people that the donor selects, usually the husband, the wife, and the children. Be very careful. I've seen trust where they say that at the death of a husband or the wife, the trust stops. And I say, what's the purpose of this? Because mm. you want to have con- continue this asset okay. base or yeah. this investment on. So the family trust is also what we call a discretionary trust. Where the donor grants to the trustees the discretion according to their own discretion any stage during the duration of a trust to allocate income or capital, normally income, to the beneficiaries. So the trustees can sit around and have a meeting and say, we've made 500,000 rand profit this year, and according to our discretion, we don't give any money to the husband because he already pays super tax, and we give to the wife and we give to the children. Now, the one, I'm going to quickly add a little bit of a thing there. One of the benefits of a trust is that if you have income that comes through the trust, you can distribute that to your children, and a lot of people then pay that into the bank account of their children, and the children then pay their school fees out mm. of this. Yeah. So they, but be careful. Don't be also again get tax advice. Don't work on the back of a cigarette box that we're discussing. Now we're just discussing to give you the In board. General, but yeah. there are so many benefits of a trust if the income stream flows correctly. So that's according to the discretion, and that's a discretion trust, also a family trust. Then you get a business trust, and the business trust is where you have five business partners, two business partners, and each of them will have almost like shareholding, fixed shareholding Mm -hmm. in the trust. I have set many up where uh, property is purchased, um, particular farm, but um, and there are rights to uh, to the use of the cottages, and we set up a structure according to that. So there we have seven cottages, and there are seven uh, shares. A we call it A shares. And then there are B shares. So there are many ways to, to structure a deal like that when you can't use a company for various reasons of Act 70 or 70. So a business trust is more for a formal business arrangement. And it's similar for me to a company where you have allocated fixed shares or benefits. You don't call it shares. You call it, um, it will be, we issued share benefits, uh, benefits share certificates. And, but you have a fixed right. There you will also make provision that if one of the beneficiaries wants to exit the trust, mm. that they allocate or they um, make available their shares to be taken over by the current beneficiaries, similar to a company. So then you have also a trust that you can create in a will, and this trust only kicks in the day when you pass on, and then the trust will uh, receive inheritance for minor beneficiaries or maybe beneficiaries that are not able to look after their own money. And then the trust will say will say that at the time of my death, the trust will kick in. And then the, the trustees will manage the in, inheritance for the beneficiaries until they uh, reach the age of 25, 30. And during, the, the, during that time, it will care for the maintenance, education, and all that stuff. So that's a world trust. Mm. and the trust uh, into a hamortis causa that kicks in, if you will. Um, That type of trust, the problem there is that it's very rigid because once a person dies, that um, it's cast in stone. And Mm. the trustees and the the donor is already dead, so the trustees can't change any of the... little legal room. Yeah, Yeah. you can't can't change anything there. Um, so there are many, many, many other trusts as well that you can use. Um, there's a commodity trust where people use for investment purposes and all that stuff. Um, so those are the basic trusts um, that one uses, either a family discretion trust, discretionary trust, or a business trust, and then a commodity trust and all kinds of other mm-hmm. trusts as well yeah. that come into the play. So I, I've, in my, in my years um, working with big corporates, um, we've, 
on several occasions used the whole uncommon deed partnership mm. uh, uh, agreement or trust. Um, when do you use that type of trust, and what's the the value of doing of doing it in an uncommon deed uh, trust? It's, it's very much where you get investment into a trust yeah. um, because there are companies that were used with a, if for example if you um, have a, a structure where you want to bring in investments mm -hmm. and there's also you want to set up some people set up a company but then there's a lot of regulation around the raising of finance yeah. and then you've got to put out a perspective prospectus and yeah. people's got a so there's a lot of rules and regulations about ranging finance and and investment um, a running running investment scheme so a lot of people use this in commodity trust to actually accommodate that type of mm. fundraising and management of uh, the finance in that regard so I think for our purposes in this one will seldom use that type of trust yeah. for buying a property so that's only when you really grow your portfolio yes. and you get to the big of uh, your Tens of millions of rands, yeah, and then yeah. you say, "Now I want to bring in financing into Some, our business." Somebody into that, then yeah. that could, could, yeah, could yeah. be of, of help. Okay. One of the things that we maybe look at financing in that regard, it's also been much easier if you have a property portfolio mm. and you have a trust where you can actually sell on shares to outside investors, yeah. than trying to do that through a trust. Because through a trust, it's very, it's more messy. One can say ah. to try to change the beneficiaries and the shareholding in a trust because the master of a high court regulates trust and administers trust and there's not such a, a strong regulation process as you're going through CIPCC yeah. where you change uh, directors and all that stuff so I would always if you're looking to build an investment portfolio and you're looking to add and uh, other shareholders or investors definitely go over company route. It's much cleaner and easier mm -hmm. to get shareholders in and out. Okay, fantastic. Okay, great stuff. So, um, the next question then following on on that one is which of those trusts is best suited when you set up a brand new, uh, let's say now you're gonna go a trust route. Mm -hmm. Which of those trusts is the best suited for setting up a property business? If you do it on your own, I would set up a family discretionary trust because okay. it's simple and easy to manage okay. and you can decide if it's only my family but let's say if me and Nigel would participate in the investment then I would set up a business trust because we would use this business trust to, to set up to be the shareholder in a company that will own properties. So it all depends if I do it on my own or if I do it with a partner. With mm -hmm. a partner we would maybe, but then even one can have a company and in a company 50% of the shares can be held by your family trust and 50% of the shares can be held by my family trust. Yeah. So one would try also not to overcomplicate matters um, and to have too many trusts lying around. A lot of people have also different one trust that will be, and similar to a company, you'll have one entity that will be involved in more risky type of investments mm -hmm. and then you'll have another trust which will be your property um, owning and, and, and the kind of security. So one will be avoid from risks and the other one will be involved in risks. Okay. And you always again want to separate the, the eggs in the basket. Yeah, but if something yeah. goes wrong with one and I think that's where in my personal capacity I've set up many trusts for different property portfolios mm. so you have to pay in different uh, use and submit different income tax returns but I've tried in my own career to have of course it's easy for me to set up trusts so I set up different trusts for different properties and we've actually just achieved that now um, two of our properties were paid off by our tenants over mm. the last few years yeah. I recently said I took my tenant a bottle of champagne he said why are you doing this I said no I just, just want to give you thank you just yeah. thank you thank you thank you and he says well yeah. and the one guy just he, he's just um, he lived the one tenant in the one property for the in duration of a bond wow. he paid it off everything wow. and um, so what we did now we decided we went to our daughter and this is a very small tiny apartment but we said to her we want to educate you in becoming a property landlord yeah. so what we want to do now in the trust is to make you a trustee as well mm. 
and we want to win um, after 15 years paying off a bond and one person living there we want to renovate her place now so she's got to go out now and raise finance and do very much what you've done a mini project manager for that but you're assisting now thousands of people on that yeah. so what we're doing now is to say okay here's a almost like a new place that hasn't been renovated untouched for 15 years so you can now do put a budget together to renovate the kitchen and the living room and that's in like a bachelor apartment yeah and this gives her the opportunity now to move into the trust to learn the tricks of a trade the bond is paid up so she's got to put the structure together to raise finance for renovations and slowly we exit out of this and she can generate receive her in, the income from that mm. um on that so for me it's always passing on the legacy earlier yeah, yeah. and waiting until we did and then she's okay what do i do now yeah. now you learn and teach and educate and mentor the idea is to do that so yeah. that's a nice thing about the trust so we are actually able to exit from the trust without paying transfer to her name and she becomes she's always she's already a beneficiary in the trust but now she will become the managing director of a trust or yeah. the managing trustee yeah, yeah. and we'll just sit there as and, and we still have an independent trustee so it will be me my wife my daughter and an independent trustee Fantastic. and we will just take the back seat and she will now become to have to to manage to advertise to deal with tenants and all that stuff so that's the idea to actually where you can pass on the legacy without transferring the property to the beneficiary without raising a new bond without if you die that the property falls into your estate and you have to pay executive fees estate duty and transfer duty on the yeah, property yeah. so you, you that's that's a nice thing about the trust if you structure it like that okay so again looking at the future and saying how uh, what do we want to do in the future and then based on that, structuring it at the beginning so that you don't have to then pay additional taxes at a later stage because you structured it wrong. Yeah. yeah. And again, what we did, we've got three children. So uh, we bought various properties and for each of them, we said that is where we gave each of them the opportunity to move into a trust. And mm. that trust, so that's why if we had one trust, it would be like, oh, now we've got to try to, <laughs> yeah, yeah. although they get on yeah. well together, but again, keep keep each other out of each here yeah. <laughs> and each one has got their own trust very small property but to manage and they my, our son just sold this one property and he used that to move to australia so that's now he's used his inheritance in that case sure, sure. but he had the opportunity for that yeah. and the other two's got their own properties under the trust that they can slowly merge into separate trust for each of them that they can mm -hmm. do their own thing they want to sell they want to buy they want to renovate so again that's for me is setting up different trust yeah. for different purposes yeah. and the other trust we're keeping and the week one can re generate revenue from that and all that fantastic well i went a completely different route i threw my kids in in the deep end i said i'm not going to give you anything make your own money <laughs> <laughs> so they had to we set up different trust for them for both of them and they each have to then go and set up a property portfolio no fantastic again, teaching them just like you have done teaching them how to do it and then do it for themselves rather than me giving them something at the end of my life before i long before i die they'll be property millionaires themselves um, absolutely so, you know uh, and i agree with you fully don't wait until you die before you leave something yeah. to your kids let them actually be involved in the process while you're still alive and you can teach them teach them how rather than to leave them something uh, it's like giving a man a fish uh, yeah, exactly. versus teaching a man to fish exactly. it's the same yeah. thing with your kids I had a client yesterday and she said that she got a daughter three years old and she's looking to buy property in a trust and the idea that she would put in a tenant uh -huh. and by the time that the daughter is 25 years old that will be her inheritance yeah. and that's one of the best ways if I look at how property bounced back after COVID and if you look at what happened to shares on the on the stock exchange yeah. they're still down there yeah. and everybody the says that doing this. Yeah. yeah everybody says oh property had uh, like a 0.5 percent or a two percent growth i said a positive growth is much better than a 20 percent dive yeah. or a 30 yeah. percent dive so hey don't knock property property is still one of the best investments you can yeah. do absolutely i mean you, you're basically talking about a 20 to 30 percent difference in even though like you say you got 0.3 or 2 percent growth here you got a negative 20 or 30 percent growth this side if your money was in shares you would actually would have lost almost 30 percent exactly but if you're in property you gain 30 percent yeah, uh, yeah if you really look at it uh, properly yeah. okay fantastic so the next question um once i start to grow and i start purchasing more than five properties that you know a lot of people talk about five properties 
uh, you know, that's sort of a magical number. It's like almost like a unicorn. Mm. <laughs> um, so when I get to five properties and I've different shareholders because I now need to fund my growth, um, uh, which then at that point, which is the best structure then? So if I started and I bought all the property in my own name, or I had one company where I was the only shareholder, or I had a trust where um, I had three benefit, uh, three uh, trustees, one being an independent. Now moving into that next phase, and I'm now going, okay, now I want to grow this portfolio and I want to bring funders in. We may go a little bit back in terms of what you said earlier on, um, in terms of, of bringing funders in, but I think it's important to reiterate. I now want to grow my portfolio, bringing new investors in, um, what is now the best way to move forward? Is it having more than one company, um, more than one trust, one company with one trust, many companies, one trust? What, what is the best structure there? Nigel, I think it all comes down to the number one, the ability to raise finance, and number two is what happens with the revenue that you make. Because at in the initial stage of any development or any any investment. You kind of break even. If you can buy a property from day one where you are cash flow positive, awesome. But very seldom you do find those gems. But we always always strive to do to buy a cash flow positive property. But most of my property I've bought were um, like maybe for a year or two. You pay in. For, sometimes it actually the market goes down, the interest rate goes up, and then you pay in for three or four years. But buy as I say with my properties. I've actually forgotten the, the days when I had to pay in. Um, so, which is like, if, you, if you're old enough, <laughs> maybe that happens to you. But, but um, so what we're looking at is our different portfolios. The one would be your own personal house. So there you ask yourself a question, if I buy my own property, um, do I put in a my name and or my spouse's name, or only my name? It looks at the ability, how are you married in community, out of community or traditional rights? Yeah. I had one person now that he's um, bought it with his girlfriend, they split. And now the girlfriend is go holding that ransom um, to, to pay more money, to pay more money. They settled yeah, for yeah. 40,000 rand, which was the equity in the property. And now he's, she's holding ransom. He now needs to pay 90,000 rand to avoid going to court. So one thing is your own property portfolio, your own personal house, looking at capital gains tax um, when you buy and sell. Then the second one would be if you grow your own portfolio. Initially, as I said, I started out in trusts and... Then as you start um, generating more income, you have to distribute that. Now, luckily, I still have to, to, to um, subsidize the family. Yeah. And therefore, one can distribute that money to... But as your kids start growing older, then they start working for themselves. And now, the income that you receive, you start paying tax on that. So, yeah. because there's no children that you can distribute anymore. Because otherwise, you burden them with their own with money yeah, with tax. Yeah. Yeah. So... I think the, 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 if you start growing the portfolio, definitely a company, because you want to now grow the portfolio. And the money that you retain in the company, if you keep it in the trust, 45% tax mm. on that, which is quite heavy. Then the best way to do is actually set it in the company, because the company will retain the money, pay 28% tax on the net profit, and keep the money there. Yeah. And they can use that money to acquire more property. So definitely the company route is the best way to go. Mm -hmm. Also, the second one is that if you buy properties and you get outside cash funds coming in, if you put that cash into the trust as a loan, so you maybe f fund 80% uh, from the bank and 20% from a private, your own loan or an investor loan or 50, whatever percentage will be, to pay back that loan account through the trust is actually a very nasty thing because you first have to pay your 45% income tax yes. and keep the money there and now you pay back your loan account which is tax free but to do that to reduce your loan account you have to first pay the taxes in the trust 45% if you have a company where you made a loan of 2 million rand to the company the company can keep that money at 28% Pay the taxes and then pay back your loan account. Yeah. So it's much cash uh, tax friendlier to actually use a company where you start with uh, cash contributions 
to actually be able to get your loan account paid back to yourself. Yeah, yeah. So if you start growing the portfolio, definitely a company. Mm. If you're two or three, you can buy directly on a trust. But if you start going bigger, so my recommendation would definitely go bigger. And now you can start looking at if you have a property portfolio that you've paid up a reasonable amount of, of um, capital and you start buying another property and maybe you gear it 100% again. And maybe there's a risk in that portfolio that you do accommodation to students or to what. And we've seen what happened to COVID now. All of a sudden, that students moved out and you're sitting there with an empty place. And maybe you have to liquidate that company. Mm. And that's the, you have to walk away from this investment. Then you can close that company and the rest of your portfolio that's on a separate company will not be attached or affected by that. So I definitely look at different uh, companies more than one because you want to manage the risk as well. It's not to say that every time that you buy an investment, everything will turn out smooth sailing Correct. for you. Yeah, yeah. So you all, sometimes you risk more and you buy something and it doesn't work out. Mm. You would like to have opportunity to close that. But remember, most of the times when you raise finance, you sign surety in your personal name. Yeah. So also be careful there that what can happen to the surety ship, but definitely look at different companies for different portfolios to manage your risk. Okay, fantastic. All right. So there's a thing um, in trusts. Uh, let's just step back for a second to trust again, um, where you can give a donation to your trust and it's, uh, and it's not taxable. So tell us a little bit about the donations and uh, for trust and tax and so on. How does that all work? Yes, this donation is a once-off donation uh, per annum. Okay. And the amazing thing about this donation, and I must now speak on a correction, it used to be 100,000 Rand. I'm pretty sure it's still 100,000 Rand, but we can check on that and post it later on. But you can donate, let's work on the 100,000 Rand, 100,000 Rand per year tax-free. Mm. So, but the amazing thing is that you can also donate to your spouse tax-free. So if you want to get rid of 200,000 rand, you can donate 100,000 to your trust and 100,000 to your spouse or your spouse to you. And then both of you can donate 100,000 each to the trust or, or a company or anybody or a child as well. And that donation will be tax free. So I have a lot of situations, maybe while we're on that point, where somebody comes to me and they buy the property of a family member. And then they want to donate it to the family member. And I said, no, no, let's rather set up a deed of sale where you sell the property to them for a million rand, fair market value, mm -hmm. SAS will require that. But you don't donate that million rand. They said, but I want them to have a house. I yeah. said, no, let's rather just set up a deed of sale where you sell the property for a million rand. And then each year you can donate 100,000 rand mm -hmm. for over 10 years. You can yeah. write it off. Yeah. There are a little bit of... Um, footwork you've got to do to to do to accommodate that it's not as simple but it's um that's a way to go where you can actually write off a million rand over a period of 10 years through this donation mm. stacks so in fact you can actually do it over five years if your wife and exactly you and your wife do you it. and a spouse yeah. both donate a hundred thousand so that's two hundred thousand yeah. and in fact over five yeah. years you can then write off yeah. and that's also a nice way for a trust to build up or a company to build up a working capital yes so if you start early and you each put in a hundred thousand rand mm. um, per year and it's the same if we have business partners yeah. and you say we are five business partners let's set up a new company and let's say donate money to the, to the company because remember if you make a loan to the to to a trust or a company that loan stays an asset in your name yes and the day that you die that asset is still an asset so you actually haven't moved the assets away from my yes. name to yeah. the trust yeah. and then you actually haven't what you've done you've frozen the value of a, of a hundred thousand rand because maybe that hundred thousand rand in the hands of a trust was invested and it's now 150,000 rand. But in your estate, it's still pegged at 100,000 rand. But it's still an asset. So you always want to get the asset off your name. And that's why people donate rather than maybe make a loan. Mm. There we must also remember that in terms of Section 7 of Income Tax Act, SARS realized people are um, selling the assets to trusts and then they keep it as a loan account. And so I said, no, no, I want you to pay tax on that yeah. loan. So also be careful that SARS does tax loan accounts to a trust. Yeah, yeah. But that's only, uh, if, if, if I understand it correctly, that's only if you don't charge interest on the loan. No, I'm saying yeah. that, yeah. yeah. But there is a, there is a certain tax threshold. You can't so much charge 
One percent. Yeah. Sauce yeah. has got to it's set gotta it. It's got to be reasonable. Sauce is, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, then, um, so how many trusts can I register? As many as you want. So I can have a thousand trusts that doesn't actually matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great stuff. And the nice thing about the trust is that you don't have to reserve a name for the trust. So again, don't go and register the Table Mountain Trust. I'm pretty sure there are quite a lot of them. Yeah. So go and find a name that is... And again, I also don't go and register the trust, the Mayor Duval Trust. Um, it's not that I want to hide something, but I want to put a trust that it's separate from me. Again, if I register the Mayor Duval Trust, it looks a little bit like my alter yeah, ego. Exactly, yeah. But a lot of people would register the Adriaanse Family Trust and stuff like that. doesn't really or you can use an abbreviation of children's names or whatever mm. a trust a, a name that's a, a trust thing that's unique yeah. but you be i have seen many trusts that actually have the same yeah. like the ocean trust or the blue trust or so there are so many uh, sunset trust, sunset trust <laughs> yeah. and all that yeah so so you, you don't have to reserve a yeah. name for a trust different to a company where you reserve fantastic wow Okay, so I've actually learned a few things myself today, um, Numiso, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, our group out there has actually learned quite a lot. Um, we've got a few more minutes, so I think if you want to ask the group, if they want to ask any questions, uh, please fire away and uh, we'll uh, try and answer everyone. Uh, but like we said, if we can't answer all, we'll take the questions and uh, we'll post the answers at a later stage. Thank you. I'll go to the first one first. Um, if you have a company and you are the, share, you're the sole shareholder, I think that's the first question. Now you want to move your shares to a, a trust. Um, there are a couple of uh, things you've got to consider. The first one is that many, many years ago, people used to sell shares in companies and they used to sell... Uh, the, member, uh, the member's interest in a, in a closed corporation and they used even to change a trust where I would exit the trust and Nigel would become the new trustee and his family would become the new beneficiaries to avoid transfer duty. So, so I said, hang on guys, you are cheating me out of transfer duty because you're changing the shares, you're changing the member's interest and you're changing the beneficiaries in the trust. And I want to put, uh, in Afrikaans we say, a stocky for stick. What is that? <laughs> So they stopped it and they said that if you ever sell your rights to a property, shares, members interest and a trust, SARS will see this as a transfer duty transaction and you'll be, have to pay transfer duty on the value of the fair market value of a share that goes over from your own name to the trust. So number one, there will be transfer duty payable. If your company is registered for VAT, that share sale from your own name or if you are registered for VAT then that sale of the shares will not attract transfer duty but it's a VAT transaction and it won't try they won't charge you VAT on the sale of that share shares that you hold in your own name that goes over to the tr to the trust the second one is that your shares will have a certain value because you started out when you purchased the company and um, the shares and now when you sell it off, it's got a higher value because the value of the company increased. And therefore, you'll be taxed on capital gains as well. So it's really important from an early day to plan your structure in such a way that you don't get caught with too big portfolio. And then you have to say, oops, now what do I do now? I actually have to keep it here because transfer duty, capital gains tax will be so nasty. But there's a, what do they call, there's a golden line around the dark cloud there is an exemption in terms of a section 42 of the income tax act and i'm not going to go too deep into that but there's a fantastic opportunity in terms of section 42 of the income tax act where you can do a share swap for assets so that's that's we're busy with a couple of these transactions and for se section 42 is a fantastic opportunity to actually help you to to transfer your shares to your trust or a company in the exchange for a share portfolio. So there are opportunities there mm -hmm. still to do that. If you actually forgot to, you sat too late and building your portfolio without, um, without realizing that my portfolio is growing and I'm now stuck with a multi-million estate 
and for all kinds of reasons. The second question, just maybe repeat your second question again. Yeah, you look at a different portfolio. So you've got a businessman that's got different companies and he's we also have to look at each of those properties. Maybe one company may be VAT registered because it's maybe generating business revenue or rental that's subject to VAT. The other ones may be residential. So each of them, we need to look at the portfolio. We need to look at the capital gains tax, the transfer duty, or maybe a Section 42 rollover can also be applicable. All right, and Dumiso, um, we sort of have run out of time on our side. So I think uh, going forward, if anybody has any more questions that maybe they must rather just post it, I will then get Maya to answer all those questions and you can then post the answers to those questions to the group. I think, uh, is that fair? So here we are and uh, you, Nigel. I just want to say uh, thank you to Maya for the time that he has spent with us. Um, guys, um, it's been fantastic and we will um, we will ask him again to come back and uh, enjoy some more time with us. Thank you very much for listening to us and we will uh, uh, see you again soon. Hello all property enthusiasts and friends of the Enterprise Development Property Fund. Today we'd like to announce the most exciting thing that has happened in property in quite a while. We launch today our exciting online academy where you can have through our Huawei tablet which is our gateway to everything related to property development and property investment. If you have started or are about to start your property portfolio, this is your gateway to understanding everything you need to know about property. Also, you will get access to our whole host of other opportunities and connections that you require to start and expand your portfolio. Once you receive your tablet, you'll register, you'll log in, and that will give you access to everything that you need to have. Number one, it gives you access to our webinars. We will host regular webinars that only people who are part of this academy will have access to, where we will have speakers from all over the country and even all over the world coming to talk about different topics within the property sector. You will have your own calendar that will tell you exactly what will happen on any given day of the year. You will have access to the events calendar, which will tell you which events are happening, whether online or offline, throughout the three years that you are with us. You will have access to our support services. These support services include the likes of Lightstone, uh, TPN, um, our McRoberts attorneys. In some cases, these support services are free. In other cases, they will definitely be at least at a discounted rate to you if you are part of this academy. You will also have access to our financing portal, which includes the likes of our 50 day challenge, our stock files, uh, any other institute that gives or lends funding to property investors and property developers, including government grants, the banks, but most exciting is our crowdfunding platform that you can have access to and exclusively to you to load your property deals if you are looking for funding. Then you will also have access to our property conversations, which are conversations that have happened over the years um, and these are all recorded, pre-recorded and you will have constant access and you can go at any stage and listen to them. You will have our group mentorship uh, program where you can come to mentorship within leadership, within business development, whatever topic that we are hosting at any given stage, you will have access to all of these group mentorships. Then the most exciting part is our classroom. Within the classroom, you literally have hundreds of hours of video and content that you will be able to access that will give you all the information you need. You will not have to go anywhere else for any information about property. When you want to learn about property, this is the place to be. You will learn everything that you need to learn in the videos, in the course material, and there is just so much information for you to learn from that you do not need to go anywhere else. This course is three years long, and once you go through each 
uh, module, you've watched the videos, you've read the course material, you will then write the assessment. In that assessment, you will be tested on everything that you have learned. And if you pass that assessment, you then go through to the next module. If you don't, you can then access the, the modules again and until you eventually pass that module. Once you pass, you go to the next module and learn about the next topic for the three duration of the three years that you're with us. You will get access to these things constantly so that if you want to go back and learn something that you maybe have forgotten, you will then be able to go back as long as you have passed that particular module. You will never lose access to any module that you have already completed. So come along on this journey with us. Come and join the Enterprise Development Property Fund. It is quite easy. Click on the link www.edpfpropertyacademy.com. Click on the join button. Fill in the information that we require from you. It will take you literally two minutes. And then once you have completed that, we will send you all the forms. You will then join the academy. We will send you your tablet at a cost of only, get this, only 300 and a month. For only 300 and a month, you will get not only the tablet, you will receive 10 gigs of data per month for the three years that you are with us. And on top of that, you will get full access to all of these services all of the funding opportunities and the academy and mentorship and, and much, much more. You will have full access to all of this if you become part of the EDTF and the Enterprise Development Property Fund Academy. Click on the link www.edpfpropertyacademy.com and you will be able to gain access to all of this. Fill in the form, it will take you less than two minutes and we will send you all the paperwork that you need in order to become part of this very exciting initiative. Like I said before, you will not have to go anywhere else. You will have your tablet, you will have your 10 gigs of data per month, which is more than enough, and you will have access to every single resource you require to start or grow your property portfolio. We're very excited to invite you, and we'll be even more excited when you come and join the Enterprise Development Property Fund in this journey of ours as we change the landscape of property ownership patterns in South Africa. This is Nigel, your host, signing off once again.